Great. I see you in the channel. Hello, everybody. Uh, many apologies. I wasn't aware that I wasn't supposed to stop the stream. Uh, anyway, we have uh, Mark Bolin uh, speaking next uh, on curating machine learning data sets in international collaborations, a case study on the island of Bali. And so, Mark, I will let you take it away. Uh, thank you, Rob, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, so this project is a uh, collaboration between the University of Buffalo and the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, specifically PhD student Santiago Tony Liu, Rajiv Iriati, and myself. And so um, my talk has a, a few different parts. Uh, I'm going to give selectively overviews of the problem, um, and then I'm going to discuss particular approaches we take to solve it, and then I'm going to try to contextualize why uh, the contribution is significant uh, for this community and for uh, uh, other communities, for example, uh, social studies of science. So um, we have uh, some prior work, related work, actually fairly recent, uh, that deals with uh, applying machine learning techniques to fields uh, of significance in Southeast Asia that have resisted uh, machine learning uh, to some degree in the past, uh, specifically ethnobotany uh, as a field of applied botany, and as well as uh, 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 the uh, specifically human uses of, of plants in context. Um, and uh, and so why Bali? Well, there are a number of reasons uh, why we're interested uh, or we kind of like use this as a study site. One is um, uh, the luscious uh, forests of, of Bali um, that are well known in films and through uh, travel logs. And uh, uh, it's, of course, Bali is a, a vacation destination, but it's an interesting place where uh, kind of like two worlds uh, meet, um, uh, a first world, if we so want, and, and an, an emerging economy. And, and that kind of like condition uh, has its own unique impact on it, attempts to to manage uh, uh, the forests and 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 care for the forests. Um, Bali has been subject in the past to more summary uh, attempts to um, classify and and work with its uh, forest assets. I'm showing you here a slide from a Global Forest Watch. So Bali is very much on the radar, um, and Bali has uh, invested in. Um, GIS uh, uh, surveys to uh, understand its land use, specifically in the city of Denpasar recently, 2017, uh, a large survey um, over, over 500 square kilometers based on uh, satellite uh, data from Sentinel-2 and, and Sat-7. This uh, focused on the urban fabric. Our interest now is to move uh, a level up in, in, in complexity uh, from the sensor suite, from the uh, AI tools, and uh, and from the, the the topics that we want to look at. So we want to look at uh, multiple uh, tropical forest categories and try and see if we can understand instances of contested land use. I'll get into that in a moment. So we were uh, lucky to get a grant from Planet Lab and have now mapped a complete uh, section of the island from, from north to south in, uh, in great, uh, great detail and identified a, a study site, it's the square, dark square in the middle around uh, body uh, botanical gardens. So that's what that study site looks like with a, um, uh, the Sentinel uh, the Planet Lab uh, data and uh, the green is 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 not the a kind of uh, Photoshop uh, activity here. So this is just our, in an RGB image. This is just luscious. So the lusciousness of this uh, area is surprising. At the same time, uh, dense urban fabric or kind of like town-like fabric interwoven with the uh, lushness of the tropical forest that has continuing growing seasons and. It's just a, a complex environment. And so our, we, we start basically with uh, 
coming to terms with the differences of, of land cover categories and land use categories in the US, say Western uh, context and in Indonesian context. And it's interesting, uh, it was kind of like an opportunity to think about the differences of concepts of land use and land cover. So cover the materials on the surface and the use, what humans do to it, but these are not necessarily so separate and it, it depends a lot what you want to do. So if your goal is mining, then you will come up with different categories than if you want to, for example, think about uh, new beaches to, to, to establish. And so there's a, there's a kind of like a cultural or intentional background to this um, categorization that underlies uh, a lot of the basis of kind of like building these frameworks. And, and so, so that's one thing to think about, but at the same time, it's also uh, a challenge because it becomes really active when we then go and look at the categories, primary forest, secondary forest uh, that are uh, used in Indonesia and try to understand how they can actually be translated into say a GIS workflow um, at the level of uh, uh, precision that we have now available through Planet Lab. Um, and so the next slides are just going to show you kind of like a, a basic the series of diagrams of how we proceed. Um, they're more conceptual. Um, and so we start with a cross section of the entire island, as I mentioned. These are 28 tiles collected in the summer of uh, 2020. Um, this creates for us uh, a reference data set. And so, as I mentioned before, we're primarily interested in uh, the natural environment, the natural forest, the different categories of natural forest and the human interactions in those forests and, and how we can uh, identify them and, 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 and map those. Um, so on a second pass, what we do, and this is uh, um, maybe uh, of interest uh, specifically, is we add local expertise. So, so the team is US-based and in Indonesia, we can't travel. And so we work with uh, two types of experts uh, locally, uh, GIS experts from the uh, from Indonesian Institute of Sciences, uh, that's Rajiv, and with local informants on the ground. So we send people out to survey certain sites that we cannot um, make sense of in our in our satellite imagery, and then um, we make use of uh, kind of so we, we we have a Planet uh, Lab grant, but we we don't we, it has a timer on it, so we don't have eternal access to this data. So what we're doing now is setting up a system, and this is a, a software solution by which we can train classifiers on our uh, high resolution data, and after it's um, make them amendable to a test data that is from the Sentinel site. So that's a cue, kind of like a, a tip from. Uh, or from tip and cue combining plan um complementary uh, sensor systems so we use the higher resolution imagery to create a base map and then compare results selectively with data from lower resolution but freely available sources so that's what this diagram should do and so how do you do that this uh, gets quite involved we don't have time for this but basically it has to, uh, the trick is uh the, the, uh, a, a, a segmented pre-training procedure where you fine tune first on the high resolution data, and then you fine tune a second step on down sampled high resolution data that kind of like mimics um, the low resolution data. And that's tricky to set that up exactly. And then you get, um, then you can kind of like pipe in your lower resolution data. And it's, it's been done in the past. We're not the first ones to uh, experiment with this, but it hasn't been applied to our knowledge to, to uh, satellite imagery in this way. Um, and so I mentioned we have uh, informants on the ground that go and uh, check things out for us. And why do we do that? Uh, we're working remotely. And of course, like everyone else, we uh, make ample use of, of Google Maps. Uh, and Google Maps has its uh, great advantages, but also its <laughs> serious disadvantages here. There's a rental car site in the middle of a of an agricultural field that's a, a you know an easy give an easy one but other other uh other snafus are harder to, to figure out so this is our local informant this is gusi with his uh mom and aunt and uh he lives in uh bukian village in the central bali and has been active in the tourist industry and the tourist industry has collapsed so we're giving him basically a a new job uh uh, in this project. And uh, so he's remunerated for his activities. This is not volunteering. This is actual uh, 
small job. Uh, uh, and we've worked with him for the Ethnobotany Project, and now he's helping us helping us here. So we sent Gusti to different places. So for example, here's a site that we could not figure out um, what, uh, what the satellite was telling us and what uh, the, the maps were suggesting. And so uh, uh, excuse me, Gusti goes out and finds that this particular site is actually currently um, early stages of, of tomato fields. Uh, and it looks, of course, nothing like that, right? We don't know when Google Maps comes together and makes its uh, data. And so there's this issue of like, going back and then comparing with the satellite and thinking about when was the, the, the image actually taken. And then you have like really real time data on the ground by a human being who's who's uh, knowledgeable in, in uh, uh, agricultural practices. Um, uh, so here's another site that we sent uh, Gusti to, uh, and this is how we kind of like do it to make sure he's going to the right spot. Um, and uh, this is then what he sends us. Now, so, so this is a strawberry field, and this is interesting for a number of reasons, uh, because um, Gusti doesn't eat strawberries, and actually Rajiv doesn't eat strawberries, and so strawberries is actually a product made for export or for uh, rich local, rich, rich tourists who come by and lavishly spend their money in in Bali. So, so in the process of kind of like verifying what we're actually seeing, we're getting kind of like background information about the the, the social politics of of how uh, the land use and practices occur in Bali that are very difficult to establish just by uh, looking through uh, satellite imagery. Uh, another case uh, of this uh, kind of like uh, so a social c conflict or potential for conflict that we uh, encounter is when we looked at this site. So this is to uh, the, uh, the east of uh, the little uh, encampment between the lakes. And at first we couldn't quite figure this out. Uh, it turns out this is a golf course. And so we sent uh, Gusti to have a look at the golf course uh, and, and he was not allowed to enter. So he could not make his verification videos for us because he was not a hotel guest. So we have all these kind of like, like as I say, hierarchies uh, that the landscape or the, the lived landscape contains that we kind of like, uh, as I say, um, wander over in our very efficient uh, uh, GIS practices. And, and when we go down in the land, we, we bring these up uh, and, and make them, make the, give them agency. And to some degree, they also matter for the very practical task of, of, of land use classification. I'll get to that in a moment. So, uh, and these little white spots are not canopies or what, so these are the sand pits, of course. <laughs> um, then the next part of our uh, like integration of, of external local knowledge is then kind of like with the uh, GIS expert in Indonesia with Rajiv. And so we work together um, in, in QGIS to uh, look at our uh, data and try to figure out the categories. And this is really tricky. So I'm going to just show you a few seconds of how Rajiv, who has years of experience with this and consults with forest management locals uh, to, to kind of like really understand the different types of uh, forest that he has, how he goes about. Okay, so, so so this goes on for a long time. These are like night sessions. Uh, it's uh, you know seven in the morning in Bali and eight o'clock at night when we have these sessions. And and it's interesting. It's like because he sees things in these sets that we that we cannot see. So we have to learn to watch and look as he does. And then there's a back and forth. And so these three steps here, the important, the most important one in that is the repeat. Right. So this is a learning process where where we're both all teaching each other how, how to do this in order to get the best possible, possible results. And so now I want to get to some of the uh, differences between these two data sets that we're, we've produced um, and uh, kind of like motivate the, the, the reason why we want to combine them in the way we do. So, so first off, it's maybe obvious, but the, the Planet uh, Lab data is almost a factor of three uh, um, higher resolution than, than the Sentinel data, as you can see in this example. Um, and if we then apply a, a simple classifier, there's a maximum likelihood onto our uh, 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 first study site on the Planet Lab set, 
uh, and the Sentinel uh, set, and that we see basically just with using five categories, the the refinement that we can get with the Planet Lab. So so we want to keep that, and yet we will not be able to have that access in the future. So so making this link between those two uh, worlds is is, is really important. Um, also, because we're working with a resource-constrained environment, I mean, the Indonesian Institute does not have the kind of money to, to uh, get this Planet Lab. So we, it's kind of like important for us to be able to establish this. Anyway, um, next, our experiment that we did was um, uh, expand from five classes to 15. And at first, we were very excited because this uh, worked quite uh, easily. Uh, and then already here in the uh, in the Balinese Indonesian uh, categories, um, working very diligently one night, until we started to look at the results, and so it turns out that uh, specifically the forest areas, the primary and the secondary forest. The primary forest is the untouched area that what a, like uh, has not been disturbed, and and the secondary is a much more complex. To, uh, area that has multiple forms of disturbance and regrowth and use. Uh, so it's kind of like a container and it's much harder to be specific about. Um, but here's one like simple problem, but still that we have not solved it is simply the, the shadows from, from the hills um, that are then misclassified as an alternate category. Um, now, uh, let me see how much time I have. Uh, Rob, how much time do I have left? Okay, I can't hear him. I'll just keep going. Um, so I mentioned that we want to apply our, our studies to uh, kind of like a socio-cultural context um, in addition to uh, land use, kind of like land, land conflicts. And we, we have an example here in an area um, that is, has competing claims. So this particular area, it's just to the uh, west of our study site, is uh, and outlined here on the left side with the blue lines is claimed by indigenous peoples in Tumblingan. And there's an overlap with an area, and that is in pink, that is uh, um, a natural reserve, and that's managed by uh, Indonesian authorities. And so what's interesting here is not only that they have an overlap of conflict of like whose land is this, but they actually share what they want to do to some degree. So this is both, these are both entities that want to protect the land, but they have very different understandings of what that means and who has access rights and what kind of uh, uh, like uh, ancestral rights would be valid and what, what the land use specifics would be, what kind of plants you could grow to replace uh, secondary forests and the third iteration, so on and so forth. So it's a complex condition that is currently being hashed out in the courts. And so our notion is that the services that we're trying to produce here would be amendable to these environments that you would not have access to this kind of information. So not necessarily just GIS experts, but people who can profit from the insights that you can uh, you can deliver. And so what kind of insights are we talking about? So here, for example, and this is very preliminary, so this is not final in any way. Um, June 2020, we started to like look at this area here. So this is in the, kind of like in the contested area up here. Uh, claimed by uh, the peoples in, in, in Tamplingan. And if you look here, you see that um, there's actually a small, a quite a, a, a reduced amount of secondary forest here. And so you see that in the, in the light yellow, right? Based on our uh, current classification abilities with these four, five classes. And if we then go one step further and combine that, compare that with the data five years ago or four years ago, we really do see that something was going on in this top left corner. Right. So and and um, it, it turns out that the differences are, are, in fact, much smaller than in the other areas. So this particular area experienced some change in, in activities that uh, that we don't understand. And so Rajiv uh, uh, attributes it to multiple factors. There's change in, in human activity there. So qua deforestation to some degree, but there's also natural events here that uh, there's water runoff, the um, erosion effects that combine to create a signature that's lumped together. And we cannot distinguish that with our current methods, and we would need additional information to, to parse that out. But the point is we have now like a, a, a tool or an opportunity to go back in history a bit and possibly offer some insights to, to these two parties uh, that might uh, in the in the end, uh, um, help them resolve differences, and in the end, of course, lead to uh, more more robust uh, um, uh, care practices for the forest. 
So uh, I want to thank our sponsors for this uh, project. It's uh, Microsoft Research and Planet Labs. And if you have any questions or want to join the group, we're actively looking for people to help. Or if you have a, a particular um, different context where you think this approach might be interesting, please let us know. Uh, contact me anytime and uh, we'll chat, take it from there. Thank you for your time. Uh, ready for questions. Awesome, thanks, Mark.